Well, again, welcome everyone uh, tonight. Uh, God bless you uh, for uh, your support and joining us this evening. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, a class, some discussion. Uh, we're ready for the next uh, maybe few chapters of Isaiah. And if you're wondering, um, it's not necessarily my intent to go through the whole book of Isaiah chapter by chapter, but we'll see how, how the Lord directs. Um, you know, I wanted to call out certain parts of, of this prophetic book, you know, as we introduced it and, and called it out that this is something the Lord wants us to read, to search diligently. And it's a message for our day. And as we get into some of these, um, uh, these next uh, verses, you know, I, I like what our brother said in our opening prayer, you know, that we, we would be ever learning. And there's more, uh, certainly more that the Lord has for us as we get into uh, these scriptures. Isaiah mentions that. He talks about understanding. And I want to sort of focus in on that a little bit. Um, he also mentions uh, the idea of how much God loves us and what he's doing for us uh, as he cares for his vineyard. And then he has a very interesting uh, situation uh, where he, the Lord is, is working with Isaiah as a messenger in the sixth chapter. And I really, uh, that, it, that'll be a great climax if we get to it tonight, um, because I think there's a beautiful message in that that is very applicable to us in, in our day. So... Uh, to kick things off, I, I, I'll get started with the fourth chapter, and I just wanted to read a few verses, uh, and, uh, and again, we'll just select a, a sum of the verses and, and paraphrase or highlight rather, uh, rather than go through the whole thing. But in the fourth chapter of Isaiah, in the first verse, it says, and in that day, seven women shall take hold of one man saying, we will eat our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by thy name to take away our reproach. Now, I think this verse actually goes a little better with the prior chapter, um, because the Lord is kind of talking about some of the judgments that will befall people. And the result of those judgments are described in this verse. And so you might think, well, what is Isaiah talking about here, and, and what does this mean that, that seven women would take hold of one man? And, you know, the sense that I get is that because of the many judgments we read through in the third chapter, that there wouldn't be uh, as many men left available for these women. Why? Because of, again, judgments or warfare or different things that have come upon them. And so why would seven women seek for one man well out of scarcity perhaps uh looking for someone to be uh, a provider or uh, for for childbearing uh and and just you know having scarce uh men available so again as, as isaiah goes through some of these judgments they're fairly uh you know they're incredibly stern and and sobering thoughts and and the lord um he goes on now and switches gears a little bit in the second verse, though, and he, he says, uh, And in that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. So he's kind of switching now again to uh, a more positive uh, message. And so, I, again, I think that first verse goes better with chapter three, and, and in chapter four, he starts talking about those who are left from that judgment or destruction that comes upon uh, the people. And those who are left are this remnant. They really are this uh, people who God wants, uh, who, who are the more righteous, and, and really this is the goal that the Lord has, that his people would be come, that they would enter into this condition of, of righteousness. And so that's why he says that that branch of the Lord 
and this people shall be uh, beautiful or glorious. And he says, um, for them, let me read, read back again here a little bit. It says, the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy. Even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem, when the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For upon all the glory shall be a defense and there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge and for a covert from storm and from rain. So a lot of different thoughts there describing again this condition that the Lord wants his people to be in. And you know the effort or extent to which the Lord is willing to go to get there. And so to be in that day, uh, a remnant among those who have um, come through the judgments of God and are remaining will be a joyous and glorious uh, thing to experience, a wonderful time to be in. And, and the Lord uh, has described here in a beautiful way, a place of refuge for the righteous, that those would be protected. And I, I believe that to be the case both now, you know, during time of judgment and afterward, that the Lord would protect his people in a very mighty and powerful way. And as we think about what's coming, we can look back to what has happened because there are so many types and shadows in scripture. And in, in for example, the book of Exodus, many scriptures point back to how God was very uh, pronounced in displaying his power in bringing Israel out of Egypt. He did not hold back. He showed his mighty hand in a mighty way and performed incredible miracles that he would protect his people and deliver them. And that's a type for today. I believe that kind of power and, and defense and, and miraculous deliverance will, will happen again as the Lord uh, prepares to gather his people. And so that's uh, uh, really kind of, uh, I suppose, a highlight we can take from chapter four for tonight and, and maybe get from there into chapter five. But before we do that, any any, any thoughts or comments on, on what we've covered so far? There's a reference to Romans 11, 4. Okay. Do you have that for us that you'd like yes, to read? Yes, okay. but what saith the answer of God unto him? I have reserved to myself. 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to the image of Baal. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's a, you know, a reference describing what it is that would be required uh, to be among those people, right? Um, because really, I think in the warfare between good and evil, Although it's sort of disguised now with uh, many, you know, many facades, ultimately there's an evil source uh, motivating evil. And what the Lord is looking for is a people who do not choose that way, who do not serve evil, who do not choose idolatry or, uh, you know, an, to, to serve evil ultimately. So that's, that's interesting as it describes who are these remnant. They are those who chose to stay with the Lord and not go after uh, other gods, right? 
brother. Uh, just going back to verse one, I hate to do it, but uh, in that time, women weren't allowed to own anything. And so if they, you know, they had to depend on the man and that's, that's kind of the situation you would have been in with after the men had been, you know, destroyed so badly. And mm. Yeah, certainly. Okay. Yeah, good thoughts and, and good, uh, good reference to bring in for sure. So, um, and we have another beautiful message in the fifth chapter. And it's so interesting that it's, it's similar to the fifth chapter of Jacob. And, you know, the fifth chapter of Jacob is, uh, as it talks about the vineyard of the Lord, it's really the most detailed account of that prophetic idea of God's vineyard, but it does touch upon it here, and it also touches upon it in the book of Luke. Um, and we talked about that last week a little bit, how that, uh, you know, as, as Nephi introduces some of these scriptures, he, he mentions Jacob, and he mentions himself and Isaiah all having a similar uh, view and a similar prophecy. And so this is sort of, uh, you know, very much, I would say, an evidence or a fulfillment in the fifth chapter of Isaiah of the scriptures in 2 Nephi 11, where I, Nephi is talking about this and saying, you know, that he delights in the words of Isaiah, and he has been shown some of the same things, uh, namely Christ, uh, the prophecies of Christ. And so he and, and Jacob and Isaiah shared, you know, those, those particular uh, prophecies and understanding. And so when you read the fifth chapter of Isaiah, it introduces it as a song uh, about the vineyard. And so he says in the first verse, now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. And this is already starting to sound very much like Jacob 5, where the Lord repeatedly makes these efforts to nourish and care for and guard the vineyard, but time after time, it doesn't produce fruit. And when you look at the, um, the original Hebrew translation, uh, we get a little bit more context that even maybe the Book of Mormon doesn't provide, because it also mentions this wild fruit, and you think, what is wild fruit? Uh, but the Hebrew word for wild has to do with um, fruit that stunk and was good for nothing. And so it actually had uh, a lack of appeal. It had a, a bad smell. It was not uh, of any value. And so it gives you some sense of those who rebel against the Lord and produce their own fruit are of no value. And the Lord is looking for someone who adheres to his ways, his wisdom, his, his righteousness, because it's only by those things that we can be of value, a, a fruitful servant, producing things that uh, that would be of worth. Now, Jacob, five, it talks about that the olive tree began to decay. It actually uses that word, decay. Yeah, that, that does kind of go along, right? I mean, if fruit is rotting or the plant is rotting, it would stink, right? And so, you know, here we are thinking, oh, I, I found a way, you know, that seems to make sense. Um, it it's actually ends up being counterproductive. It, it's the opposite of thriving. It's actually rotting. And that's kind of what's being described here. Okay. And so um, in the third verse there, it says, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done it? 
Uh, wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. And now go to, I tell, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof, and it shall be eaten up and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down. Again, very similar words to what you read in other scriptures, certainly in Jacob 5, uh, where there's sort of this threat to um, kind of throw in the towel and, and, and let down the hedge and, and allow for uh, destruction to happen and a fresh start. And, uh, you know, as you read through that, I, I wonder what, what, what are our thoughts about that? Do we see that the Lord has, has done everything that he can to nourish us in the right way? Is there anything that the Lord has, has held back? Is there any sort of, you know, defense that we can offer him to say, well, Lord, if you had done this, we would have listened. Is Jeremy, this, can we assume that this is after Noah? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it's an interesting message, I think, that applies to many time periods, because as you read through Jacob 5, it, it sort of goes through various eras, right? And, and the repeating uh, of history is that time and time again, we end up in the same boat, having fallen short. And, and so time and time again, the Lord is doing different things, which coincide with major events in history, right? With the falling away of Israel, the grafting in of the Gentiles, and all these things at different points throughout history, just to bring us back again uh, to where we would be in a, a place of spiritual health. But yeah, I, I definitely think yes is the short Thank answer. <laughs> yep. Further? Yeah. Um, if you look at it, he built a tower to watch over it. He did everything he possibly could. And he even built a wine press because he had hope for the people. Yeah. He had hope for the, the results. Yeah. He did it, you know, everything was in order, but the, you know, the, the tree wouldn't produce. <laughs> mm -hmm. The vineyard wouldn't produce. Yeah. The Lord was preparing for that harvest. Yeah. Right. And, and I think, um, you know, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts if you have something different in your perspective of what it is to have a harvest for God. Uh, but for me, I just think that the Lord wanted there to be uh, the potential for love and relationship and the, the fruit or joy that comes out of that. Uh, out of shared love, out of uh, a mutual love. And that was possible through his creating of us and through his turning us to, to our own will, our free will, to make a willful decision to serve him and love him. And that is the means by which he would re reap the harvest, the harvest being the joy that comes from that love, uh, that, that, that love that would be uh, evident in our decision to serve him, to take that free will and, and turn around and return to him. And so that, that's really what he's, he's looking for. Didn't the Nephites do that? Yeah, I, I think that, um, you know, there, there are pockets of, of people who have been fruitful. The brother of Jared and his people. Yeah. yeah but what you're people. after is something lasting. Mm. Because they didn't last. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, you know, ultimately, um, anyone who, who serves God as an individual, enduring to the end, would be a part of that harvest. Um, of course, you know, the Lord's desire would be for um, not just one, but many, a righteous people, a full harvest. Uh, you know, imagine, you know, with the analogy, you go out to a garden, you've got a full plant that can produce hundreds of fruit, but you only find one or two. 
uh, you know, on each plant that's worth um, picking. You know, I think the Lord certainly is, is desirous of a greater, uh, a greater success. Um, Brother Jeremy, I was thinking about that scripture that says, um, where the Lord says that he is the vine and we are the branches. Mm. Here, it doesn't seem like the branches are abiding in him mm. and they're not producing the fruit. And um, he's very disappointed, yeah. you know, because he did everything that he could that they would bear fruit, but they didn't, you know. Mm. Well, and I think that's a good line to focus in on because it's kind of a harrowing message if you really think about it. A lot of times people will say, well, if I had the right circumstances, I would do better for the Lord. And so they're waiting. And ultimately what that waiting becomes is a procrastination uh, or a delaying of your service to God. A, a delaying of your salvation, you know, um, and, and I think it's so easy to do, to make those excuses and say, well, I would give more time to the Lord, but I have this or that sort of obstacle, and, you know, the Lord's sort of calling us out on that right here. He's saying, look, if I had done more, if I had given you, uh, let's just say, freedom from your job, freedom from whatever constraints you are using as, as an excuse not to serve me, would it really have made a difference? Would you have made a different choice? And I think, you know, if we're honest about it, you know, we ultimately make our choices. And at the end, we're not going to be able to say, well, Lord, I didn't do my best for you because of this or that. And, and it's not going to hold water, you know, on that day, I'm afraid. And so, He's kind of saying here, look, I've done everything that I could have done. And it's, it's a loving act, for sure, that the Lord has done so much to nurture uh, our souls. Uh, Jeremy, um, every fruit needs to be grafted. If the wild one comes up, there's no taste. Mm. So in the 15th chapter of... Uh, of, uh, John talks about the vineyard and how do we get ourselves right into the vineyard? First is repentance and baptism mm -hmm. and having the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so that's how we get rid of the bitter fruit. I think I was a bitter fruit. How did I come in? By repentance. And I got into the vine. So mm -hmm. all fruit has to be grafted uh the grapes has to be grafted or you're going to get wild grapes mm -hmm. uh, peaches you're going to get a, a bitter taste so i had a vineyard and i have all this fruit so i know what i have to, what i'm doing and and uh that has to be grafted it doesn't it doesn't stay so when we plant a, a wild grapevine we have to graft it we get a piece of something that is good and we get it grafted in. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same thing with us being baptized, yeah. with being grafted in. And uh, the other part is that when we graft, we put a rubber band around it. And that is to hold it in place. Mm -hmm. What holds us in place is the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. That holds us in place. Mm -hmm. And so um the other one we put a salve on it to keep away all the bugs and the diseases and make sure that it's all covered up mm -hmm. and then it will start to grow so we have to grow also that tree has to grow also that vine has to grow some also so you've got to water you've got to fertilize Everything has to be on time. You can't say, now I have a almond orchard and I can't say, uh, I'm gonna skip this week of watering. Mm. That mm. don't work. You have to water or you get no fruit. Mm -hmm. so same thing with us. If we don't serve the Lord, we're not gonna get any blessings. 
we're going to fall by the wayside. So just a little, uh, yeah, what I've gone through. Yeah. And that's very interesting. I, I'm crazy about nature. And so, and I really believe that, that the Lord designed nature to work in such a way to point to our spiritual walk. And of course here, he's actually using the vineyard, right? As a, as a right. an analogy. Um, but I think he made nature work that way on purpose, that it would, everything points to the Lord. You know, we, I, I mentioned, we went to the mountains. So we found this place that's remote. Um, you step out at night and you look up and you can see the full Milky Way and wow. the daytime, you know, right now it's uh, fall and the aspen trees are yellow and orange and red. And you just look at this expansive view of millions of pine trees and other kinds of trees and the mountains. And, and you think all of that has one source. Lord is a source of, of life. And it's just springing out uh, before you in this, this amazing view. And you think, how could you not, you know, think of the Lord as you behold something so glorious and, and so evident of God's power. And so, yeah, that, that's a beautiful analogy that the Lord is saying. And, you know, to carry it on even one step further, um, it says at the end here, the Lord's threatening to take away that hedge, that protection. Now, that's a judgment upon those who willfully choose to go away from the Lord, right? And when we talked uh, about this a little bit in our last week or two in this series, we, we talked about that storm that comes and that those who would build upon the rock would be prepared for that storm. And we know that scripture, right? And we know it says that if you build upon a sandy foundation, that the storm comes and washes that away. Well, it, it strikes me here as we read about, um, you know, this vineyard, that the Lord is taking the hedge away. The Lord is essentially bringing the storm. So, you know, sometimes I think we consider, well, maybe I'll get away without a storm. Uh, but, you know, the Lord will, will come and, and, and he'll come for his harvest. And those who are, are ready will be harvested. And, and you know, he, he, he's, he's a, 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 a divider between the wheat and the chaff, right? And so we can't go through life thinking, well, maybe I'll evade a storm or I'll live in a I'll be fortunate. I'll live in a time where there is no storm. There's a storm. <laughs> in one way, shape, or form, that work that we've built will be tested and tried. And so we need to live in such a way that we take the scripture at its word and we count on every letter being fulfilled because we know that's exactly what God says he'll do. He's going to fulfill every part of it. Well, we all, we also need that hedge about us. Yeah, we need a hedge about us, and we have to be careful that the Lord don't take it away. Mm. So, um, same thing with uh, Israel. He hedged them about the land of Canaan. Nobody could touch them mm. until they went into sin transgression. He took that hedge away, and then the Syrian army came in. I believe here in the United States, 9-11, the Lord took the hedge away from us. Yeah. We don't have that hedge anymore. Yeah. And we're going we're to see a lot more. And, and what sort of seems evident to me is that people don't realize their need for that hedge. They yeah. think that their own efforts are what causes their prosperity. And so they don't understand or acknowledge the, the true reliance we have upon the Lord. And when he steps back and we suddenly realize we can't stand any longer on our own, uh, we, we, we have a, kind of a wake-up call at that moment to say, well, I, I, I was leaning upon the Lord a lot more than I thought in those, those good times, right? Brother Jeremy. Yeah. Brother Jeremy, I'm going to 
Um, there was a revelation given to the church that God did take his hedge away from the land of America. That's right. But at the same time, too, um, like you were saying, he says, I've done everything that I can. Well, he's given us the tools. He's given us all the tools. It's up to us to use them. We had a study the other night when we were studying the scripture where it talked about if we are entrusted to what God and Christ has given us already, and we do the best with it, and we study, and we learn, and we grow spiritually, then he's going to give us more. But he's not going to give us more. And, and you know, we're all looking for all those beautiful gifts to come back stronger and everything. Well, he's not going to give them back to give them to us unless we are taking care with, with what he's already entrusted us with. Mm. And, he, and even, even uh, some of the scriptures, and maybe you'll remember, Brother Jeremy, where it's at. But after every verse, he said, my arms are outstretched still. Mm -hmm. Okay. He's given everything he can. Uh, you know, the, the, the worldly saying, you know, in a bag borrowed and steeled. He's done everything he could to give us what we needed to survive and to grow spiritually. But we have a responsibility to, to nurture that. Yeah, and I liked how Brother Joe was describing each step of that process and the importance of it, you know, that it needs to be done, it needs to be done on time. Uh, so it sort of conjures up this idea of, of diligence, you know, the diligence that's required uh, for us to, uh, to succeed. Also, I understood when you put the rubber band around, like Brother Joe saying, that's there to help you steady yourself to get your foundation strong, just like you were talking about, Brother Jeremy. You know, without that foundation, anything that blows by, we're going to fall over. Mm. And that rubber band holds it there until it's able to grow onto it, graft into it, and hold on. Mm. So I think, you know, we're, we're, and I love that. It's so true. We need something to bind us to the Lord. Um, and, and, uh, understanding that importance of staying close is so key. Uh, and, and as you read through the rest of the chapter, and I won't um, read through too much of it, I'll let you do that, but I would encourage you to, to go through the rest of it and see if you agree with some of these points that I'm about to pull out for, for us to, to think about. And, you know, because the chapter goes on and to pronounce many woes upon the wicked. So, you know, he begins to describe what happens when this hedge is removed. What happens specifically to those, as it would describe here in, in this fifth chapter, that are busy with doing their own things. And, it, you know, the scriptures use this phrase, you know, th those who regard not the work of the Lord. And he says, therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. And he says, uh, the mean man shall be brought down and the mighty man shall be humbled and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment. That's the 16th verse. And, you know, it, it, it strikes me very much that that word of knowledge or, or understanding. And, you know, he, he warns us time and time again, Isaiah, he talks about people who can hear the word of God, but don't understand it. And I really wonder what separates the two. What would determine that, that, that you or I are people who hear and understand or people who hear the same thing, but somehow don't understand. And, you know, I, I go back to, again, you know, Brother Joe's analogy, each of those steps to, to successfully harvest or grow fruit needs to be done with diligence. And, and the Lord has, has said, I've, I've laid out the word 
the, the truth, uh, the, the source of knowledge, but it's our diligence to really seek through it, to, to think about it, to meditate upon it, to pray about it, and to apply it to our lives. I, that seems to be the missing component that would separate perhaps between you know, the understanding and the not understanding. To me, Jeremy, the, the biggest problem that that uh, the prophets who were there during the destruction of Jerusalem uh, came across that they couldn't solve was the lack of repentance. Mm. They just couldn't solve that problem. They couldn't get it from the king. They couldn't get it from the people. Uh, uh, obviously, there were some who were considered good because they were sent to Babylon and came back uh, as the remnant. But uh, for the most part, repentance just didn't happen, wouldn't happen, no matter what they said, what they did, and what warnings they had from God. And it seems to me that that's what's happening today, that the hedge having been broken down, uh, we now see extremely arrogant people who have no repentance whatsoever for the lies they're telling us and the, uh, the obvious errors they're making in their, you know, we continually hear they're incompetent. And they had no repentance for that. So we're saying to me, that's that's the key. You, it's almost like God won't water the plants until He gets repentance out of them. Mm. Uh, Jeremy, yeah, uh, what you said about um, those understanding and those not understanding. I think it's just simply one word, and that's desire. Mm the desire to know. And those that don't understand, they don't desire to know. Mm -hmm. it's, it's that simple, I believe. Yeah, it's a huge component. Um, what is the song we sing? Uh, if ye be willing. Uh, and if you don't have that will or that desire, uh, well, it's just not going to happen. And, and you know, part of that is faith, right? God has wired this entire uh, gospel or hinged it upon faith. If we have that desire to, as you're saying, to exercise that faith, to believe, then the Lord step by step begins to reveal truth to us. And those scales are lifted. And I don't know, I mean, I think of scales, there's many scales. If you've ever scale the fish it's just amazing how much comes off and sometimes that's how it is for us we're perhaps removed from our state of blindness one scale at a time sometimes uh, because by faith we take a step forward and then the, the lord reveals more and, and by faith we continue and that does like you're saying require a, a great hunger or desire for these things but if you don't take that first step, then there is no removal of the scales. There is no understanding. There is blindness. And so you have to have faith. You have to believe. And so we have this idea uh, about our day, right? That it's, it comes down to believers and non-believers. And, you know, but there's more to it, right? Because those who are believers understand what it's like to have that experience, those scales begin to come off and you begin to see and you begin to have knowledge. And that's what Isaiah is saying is lacking here. You lack knowledge and, and you can't have knowledge without faith. And so it's a beautiful process, but it's, it's also uh, sort of dumbfounding uh, to explain this to someone in the world who has no faith or desire uh, they're really stuck at that point until they begin to uh, to believe, right? Well, in the book of fear, in the Book of Mormon, it states a time will come when the scales shall fall from the seed of Joseph, mm. and they begin to see. So the the Lord really has to do that 
right? Yeah. You know, and, you know, I've talked to um, a lot of people about uh, when they found out, uh, I believe in the Book of Mormon, and I tried to show them, I said, I can show you right in the scripture, King James Version, and, but they just, they won't accept it. So well, that, that's, that doesn't mean that way. So, um, so there's nothing you can do if they don't want to accept it. Yeah. So what we're talking about here really is sort of the 13th or so through the 16th verse um, of Isaiah 5. And it lays out this dramatic uh, situation. Because what it says is basically, uh, you, you know, this is, this is difficult. But it says in the 14th verse, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. And their glory in the multitude of their pomp, and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. So this is describing to me a mass, a, a, a great mass of people who are not willing to believe, and their eyes are blinded, and it's a great loss. It's a, tr it's a tragic loss of people, and, and they just have no idea what they're missing and it, it, it becomes more and more evident to us the more we extend ourselves before the lord that that treasure that's available and 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 isaiah is very clear here that in as much as we have great treasure available to us we have great calamity and and judgment available as well depending on the choices that we would make and so we're at the, the, this precipice uh, of something either great or terrible. And I think about, you know, even uh, growing up in the church and reading some of our pamphlets and, and literature about, you know, some of our, our uh, predecessors, even in our day and time. Uh, you know, I think about the testimonies and, and some of the you know, booklets and, and the power of God that was manifested in the lives of some of our previous generation. And, and, and we see it today too. But, you know, you read these stories in, in, in their totality because those people have come and gone. And so you get to read the fullness of their story, right? And, and what they left behind is a testimony of God's power. Situations where the dead were raised, where people were outside of their bodies and taken to different places spiritually. I mean, we, we're familiar with these stories, and, and we, we know the potential when we are diligent in the Lord. It's, it's tremendous. And so I think of this as sort of a continuum. There's every stage between, you know, what I just read in 14, right, the, the worst case scenario, all the way to a best case scenario. And what I would implore of us myself included tonight is that we don't settle for something middle of the road or, or below but that we would reach for something greater and and we know because we have the the testimonies in our hands tonight that that when we put ourselves before the lord and and we're diligent that he will show forth his mighty hand and bless us in amazing ways but that's only available, again, through that process of more scales coming off, more faith being extended, uh, and, and the Lord blessing as a result. You know, so the same degree to which we put forth that, that effort and that faith, the more joy and blessings and power we see. And, and you know, the more we recognize the value of the treasure that God has offered us. I... Uh... I feel uh, bad about um, okay, um, um, yeah, yeah. Jeremy, this is Brother Matthew. I think that what you're driving for is one of the greatest things there is. But there's only one way we can obtain it. And that's by calling upon him from the depths of our soul. Mm. And when we fall on our face and cry, oh, God, show me what is right. 
how to do it. Then he began to give open that book to us, this book, the Manufactured Book of, uh, of Jeremiah, of uh, uh, Isaiah. That's a great book. But it's been given to us for a reason that we might open our eyes and understand what, what, you, how, what would you like God to do? He sits in the circle of the earth. And people are before him like grasshoppers. What does he want of us? He wants our heart. He wants all of it. He wants all of you. Mm -hmm. When he said the words, you have to be born again. There was a beginning. A nation of all the things that you were before are no more. They were worthless. They are garbage. He wants to make another kind of a man. Yeah. And he wants to make another kind of a person. And until he does that to you, he don't understand the depth of it. The greatness of a living God. Yeah. He came and gave his life for us on Calvary. And when he did, he pointed and said, I am the way. No other person has that ability. All that we try to create are, are should we say, our foolishness. It's a waste. Until the time comes when we fall on our face and cry, Oh, God, have mercy on me. Nephi spoke concerning this. When he looked into the one, one chapter there, he began to sell his inner parts, his inner soul. He began to see his own weakness and jerk him. How, uh, how did the Lord took him up in a mountain? Away, there he could he begin to see things that he never saw before, mm. and it wasn't because of his righteousness, there was nothing he could do that could ever do it. It was in, in God. And when we get to a place when we give up ourselves, oh Lord, take me, yeah. make me the kind of man you want, show me what I must do. Unless we do this, we don't understand the greatness of it. Mm. We spoke last week concerning some things, but I Hope you don't misunderstand me. Yeah. I think the beauty of serving God, the church itself, was created not by man. No man ever had anything to do with the beginning of the church. Mm -hmm. The book itself, the Bible, Book of Mormon, one of the it's accurate in every respect. And after that, it was published. Joseph Smith went into error and did things he shouldn't have done. But the Book of Mormon was given to us. The Bible and the Book of Mormon, that we might understand there was only one, the Son of God who was going to be born, the condescension of God coming to us. Let us look up. And I want to tell you, when we look up continually, when we come to the cross and fall on our face and look up, then we're able to understand the beauty of what makes the church as great as it is, as it has been over the many years. I thank God for these things, my brother. I hope you don't mind me speaking. I, I don't like to, to anyone to feel as though that I'm taking a lead. I'm not. I'm not here for that. I'm here because I want to see the beauty of the cross the way it should be done. Mm -hmm. There's only one, and we got to cry unto him to help us in every respect. Well, I, I thank I, God for this. And the, you know the unity of the spirit. Mm -hmm. We spoke this in conference about the day he might be one as we are one. Yeah. One, him, he alone, no one else. Or anything that I create is going to be vain unless it's built in Jesus Christ. The beginning and the end. There is no other source of strength. Yes, it's, it's God has blessed us according. I hope you don't mind speaking. But I want you to understand one thing and love what I do. Amen. And one day he called me. And I came. And when the time came, I began to cry. When I came back from overseas in the service, I was a broken man. When I came back, I said, I was a nervous wreck. And I said, Lord, I want to get closer to you. He said, come on closer. <laughs> Lord, I want to get closer to you. He says, come on closer. Lord, I want to get closer to you. Come on closer. Come on closer. Come on closer. And all of a sudden, the book opened up and everything opened up. There was an entirely different ballgame. 
It wasn't me no more. Mm. It was Jesus, the Son of God, that took his place on a throne. I got to put him on that throne. Mm. He alone, and we have to look up to him. My eyes opened up to the beauty of the things which belong to the church and belong to us. And sometimes we foolishly try to you see, we're going to straighten this out, we're going to straighten that out. It can't be done that way mm. until we get to a place where we fall on our face. Remember the words which he said, and I say this quite often, you must watch and pray always. For Satan desires to have me, he might sift you as we. And he says, you must, not that you ought to, not that you should, you must watch and pray always. And the Lord speaks to us. And he's speaking to us today, my dear brother. I want you to know that. And in love, I speak what I do. Pray for God bless you. God bless us in our effort to be one people built upon one foundation, the foundation of the Son of the Living God. It was him, the condescension of God, the man who came down. It was him and him alone because we couldn't do it ourselves. They didn't do it themselves either, even back in Isaiah's time. It's identically the same as today. Yeah. He sits in the middle of the earth and the people are before him with grasshoppers. Mm. Who are you liking God into? You know where he's at? Do you really know? Do you do? You understand? May God give me the strength, not anybody else, to be an example of truth, to encourage us in every respect we can. May God bless you. God bless you too, brother. And you know, what you were saying is bringing to life the words that Sister Judy mentioned. What is it to have that desire? And how much desire do we really need to have? And I think, you know, that's a great description, a much more uh, complete uh, description of what it is that, that we need to uh, demonstrate before the Lord, a complete surrender, uh, and, and the testimony that goes along with it. So very beautiful. Uh, I know, uh, as you were trying to get off of mute, I think Brother Joe was making a comment. Brother Joe, uh, did you... Uh, <laughs> I forgot better. what I was going to say okay, now. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, uh, but I'll, well, I'll, I'll think of it. Yeah. Good, good. Well, I um, let me check and see here where we are. Okay, we're about at the hour. I just oh, want to leave you with, um, with... I know what I wanted to say. Okay, go ahead, brother. I wanted to want to say. Um, I'm very concerned. Is I, when I'm reading the Book of Mormon, uh, those that don't serve the Lord, where they're going to go. Mm. And that is forever and ever and ever. And so I'm concerned about some of our members um, come once every six months and got one foot in, one foot out. Uh, some has fallen by the wayside. And uh, I'm concerned about all of them. And uh, because... Uh, we know what it's all about. We know where we're going to go. And so um, uh, as a minister, I try to do the best that you can to help somebody else. Somebody's not coming and calling them up, talking to them over the phone. Mm -hmm. And so um, I can't go out that much. I'm in a wheelchair, but I can use a phone. And I can call and I can uh, encourage. And that's about all I can do now. Before, I spent 60, 60 years in uh, Mexico. And uh, I wish I could go. I'd go tomorrow if I could. But I can't. And so next week, I'll be 92 and I can't do any more. But I, at least I can do that while I'm here. And that's, that's significant. And it, it brings to light how there's there's more to be done uh, that we can do in one way or another as we endure to the very end. There's a work to be done. Yep. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the chapter really kind of goes on and, and spells out many of these woes upon 
the wicked. And as you're saying, uh, you know, Brother Joe, we have two motivators, right? We have a motivation here in the, these words to avoid what befalls the wicked. And then we have the motivation uh, to enjoy what comes upon the righteous. And so those two forces hopefully will, will push people in the right direction. Um, but I, I just wanted to leave you with this, you know, in, in the next chapter, I'm familiar with this, this set of scriptures, but I, as I was reading it, it struck me in a different way this time. And, you know, it, these, these familiar verses, I'll, I'll briefly go through the, them uh, just at the beginning of chapter six. It says, uh, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings, and with twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. And then said I, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And so I want to pause there for a moment and say that in this first five verses, Isaiah is brought into the presence of his Lord, and he knows that he is unclean and his people is unclean. And, you know, he's, he's trying to warn the people, but he, he still looks upon himself as falling short before the Lord. And so in that position, feeling as though he was unworthy and unclean before the Lord, and then coming to bear or, or to speak for a people who was worse yet, he shuddered in the presence of God. And I can imagine that many of us might think in very similar ways today. You know, Brother Joe was just mentioning, what are we going to do to send the voice out, the message, the call to those who've left the path of God? How can we encourage them? And are we doing enough? And I look around us and I see a people in this world that is struggling greatly with the things of sin. And I look upon my own life and I go before the Lord in prayer and I feel much the same way, perhaps, as Isaiah felt in, in that moment when he was brought into the Lord's presence and he trembled before the Lord and he felt unworthy to be there. And I want you to listen to what happens next. He says in the sixth verse, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand which he had taken from the tongs of the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. And you know, as we go before the Lord today, I hope that we can do the same, that we might go before the Lord and be purged of our iniquity, that we might see our state and tremble before God. But in so doing, with that humility, that we might see the Lord has mercy and compassion upon us, and that he might purge us of our iniquity, that we might go ahead and do what, the, what Isaiah has said next that we might say, though I'm unworthy, I've been made clean by the Lord. And now, Lord, go and send me. Send me to do the work that you have and to send the message that you have for the people. And, and that, I think, was something that struck me as I put myself in Isaiah's shoes. And I said, you know, I don't feel worthy. And I don't feel like our our people are always where we need to be. And certainly as I look around and see the people in the world and are they serving God? No. And I tremble before the Lord because of it. But I think, you know, the Lord still has a remedy. And he used Isaiah. And he can use you and I in the same way. And so we're before a great opportunity, I believe, as the Lord would use us today in a time of, of great need. Amen. It's a beautiful thing to serve the Lord. From the depths of our soul and fall on our face even as Isaiah, mm. and that call of fire touched his lips, he became clean. Yeah. Amen, Jeremy. Amen. The result of repentance, right? Yeah. Yeah.
there's something that we need to find. And it belongs here. It is a gold mine in this church. But I want to tell you, you've got to dig for it. You've got to search it out. And if you dig for it, you'll find the things that you're looking for. The beauty of the cross. The wonders that belong to the people of God. Yes, they've been called. They've been numbered. And they got to return continually back to him. Mm. The one who gave it to them. The son of the living God. There's only one. And we got to reach out and grab a hold of the cross. To the depths of our soul. And look up. He said, if I, if I be lifted up, home, I will draw home. Oh, the beauty of the church. When we can see the depth of it, what does Isaiah say? He gave it to us, and now only after so many years, 2,000 years, we have the scriptures, the, 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 uh, of, uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. That are identically the same. There is no difference. There was only one people, a lowly, humble people. Read the words of Isaiah. They're far so great beyond our comprehension. Forgive me for speaking out, but I think necessary for us to understand the beauty that we got to reach. I have to fall on my face continually. Oh, what? God, have mercy on me. Hmm. No one else. There's nobody else in this matter but me and my God. The same way with you. And I got to be with you because you're my brothers and my sisters. And we're only one people. We got a job to do. And it's greater than what we think. <laughs> only great because we need to come to the cross. So we might have the right material to be the people of God. Amen. Well, I certainly agree. Um, there's gold in Isaiah, and you have to dig <laughs> to uh, get it. Take some work and some uh, effort to understand. Um, but uh, like so many scriptures, you get more each time you read it. But uh, well, brother Jeremy, yeah, yeah, go ahead, sister. Um, sister Marlia Frenzos uh, lost her husband yesterday, in Middle Tennessee. Um, and within a few hours, the chaplain from hospice came to visit. And right away, she didn't even waste a minute. She said, the chaplain said, many different churches talk about the state of soul after death. And Marlia said, well, let me tell you about the Book of Mormon. It's the key. And there was a prophet there that talks about how the soul goes immediately back to um, God. And... Um, and then again today, when I spoke to her, she said um, the chaplain came back and I had an, a greater opportunity to speak to her. And at the end of our conversation, she said, I want to be a voice for God. Mm. And I said, that's beautiful, Marlia. Yeah. That's just beautiful. So remember her, um, you know, it was very sudden that her husband passed and, um, you know, just those that are mourning that the Lord would comfort them. Well, thank you for mentioning her need and we'll certainly pray for her and how beautiful the comfort of the scripture, even that scripture in particular, what it brings to us in understanding. Yes. That's a wonderful testimony. Brother Jeremy. Yeah. You know, you know what I see here too, is I see prophecy unfolding, you know, especially you get to the 20 and 21st birth. You, you see, that's the way people are behaving. But I like, too, what it says at the end of the 25th, his hand is still stretched out. Even with all these woes, we see through Scripture, through the Book of Mormon, and all through the Bible, even with all that, his hands are still stretched out to us, you know? So he always gives us hope. Amen. Well, it's been a joy to be with you tonight, and I, I always like to hear your testimonies and, and, and thoughts, and uh, may God bless you as you go into the weekend, and um, even as Brother Matthew was mentioning, closer and closer to the Lord. Uh, it's, it's the way we should be, and it's a joyful um, 
joyful way to live. Um, I hope and pray we can succeed in our efforts, our endeavors to draw near to the Lord. Um, so may God bless you. And, and I hope that your meetings and fellowship and whatever opportunity you have this weekend will be uh, richly blessed. Will you be with us next Tuesday? Yeah, I'm back uh, back in town this week. And uh, so, yep, be on an, on Tuesday as well. Good. Great. Well, thanks, everyone. God bless. And uh, uh, let's see. Brother, uh, Brother Larry, could you close us in prayer tonight? So I'll bow our heads. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we, Lord, we compare ourselves to you. We too are undone. Mm. And we need your spirit, Father, to be upon us. We need to know, Lord, that we are right with you. We need to know, Lord, that we are walking in your path. And I pray, Father, that you would continue to direct us. Continue to lift us up, Lord, as we would call upon your name. And be with those that are mourning, those who are afflicted, Lord, those who are having trials in their life. I ask, Father, that you would encourage them and strengthen them and even heal them, Father. And help us as we go about our daily lives, Lord, in between our meetings and our fellowship, Lord, that we would, too, be willing to be a minister, to be a messenger, someone who wants to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, that others might not be lost. Pray, I, Father, in the name of thy son, Jesus, that you would be with us. And I would ask these favors and blessings in his name. Amen. Amen.